Maths and derivations, uh, well, at some point we've all got to do something we don't like, so this is going to be one of those mostly mathematical things. Now on the, back, on the bright side, I don't expect you to memorise all of this. This is just going to be deriving what we mean by root mean squared and why is it important. Now, uh, again, I know I keep banging on about this. If you, man if you remember that whole John Stone's triangle thing, oh, this really does hit all of these. Um, sectors. So what we're going to start looking at is the microscopic world of uh, molecules and so on. And then we're going to try and f uh, derive a macroscopic property from it, i.e. pressure. But we're going to go through a little bit of mathematics to justify it. So we really are going through this entire cycle uh, because once we can define, say, a root mean squared speed or a speed of molecules, we can get pressure out. And between it, there's mathematics. So if you're mathematically literate, you could probably skip through and just read these slides and not listen to me garble about it. Uh, if you really, really don't want to and you just want to pass an exam, you can skip this and just learn the equation at the end. You will be asked to apply it, however, so don't think this is entirely optional. Um, but let's go ahead and see what we're going to actually cover today. Uh, one, pressure and concentration. This will be a minor amount of revision if you've already done a bit of A-level kinetics before. Uh, I'm just trying to get a relationship between these two down before we move on. Uh, and then velocity and momentum of molecules. So this is kind of how does this relate to pressure? And then finally, the whole concept of this root mean squared speed idea, working out a particular... Um, sort of measure of molecules velocity in a gas. So quite a bit of maths, a bit of heavy on the theory side, uh, but hopefully I can take it slowly bit by bit and I hope you can follow it. Uh, so first, pressure and concentration. Previously in the first half of this, the first topic, uh, we mostly looked at kinetics from the idea of concentration. So uh, rate constant times a concentration of some description. So we wrote concentration down in these square brackets. Uh, for gases, we don't quite define concentration like this. We actually define it in terms of pressure. Uh, now, if you look quickly at these two diagrams here, uh, you can see sort of an analogy between concentration and pressure. It really is just the number of units per particular volume. So if we have a set volume of liquid and we have this many uh, molecules in, clearly this is a high concentration. Uh, this is clearly a low concentration. Similarly, this is a low pressure and this is a high pressure. There are more molecules in there. Uh, one thing that you'd be really more interested in with gas phase reactions though is something called partial pressure. Um, so before I explain that, I'm going to look at an analogy involving concentration. So if you were to do a solution-based reaction that involves breaking things into ions, uh, for instance, uh, something had to split into A plus and B minus at some point, and you want to change the concentration of this, you have to keep your ionic strength similar in order to make the reactions uh, considerably the same. So you would add something like sodium chloride. That would be relatively neutral towards your reaction but it would keep the ionic concentration exactly the same. So the overall concentration of anything with a charge remains the same because you've uh, made it up. So in this case, for instance, you can see there are very few of these smaller molecules on this low concentration side. There are a lot more on this side here. Yet the total number of molecules is the same. So their overall concentration of everything remains the same, but the, con the relative concentration of what you're interested in changes. Uh, the same is very true with partial pressure. You want to keep your overall pressure the same. That's pressure is defined with a P. Uh, and you can count them up. There are all the same number of molecules in both of these boxes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, no, however many I've added in. But you can see the difference. So there's only three of these green ones I've added in. Only a handful of them here and a lot more of the green for instance. So the overall pressure is the same, but the partial pressures of each of these two gases differs. It's sort of a molar concentration of each. So just to 
review that section quite quickly. Uh, our concentration uh, is defined as the number of discrete entities for the volume. Remember, we are not interested in grams as much in kinetics as other people might be. Uh, and pressure is also defined as the exact same thing. So there is a, an analogy between the two. Uh, so we can do kinetics pretty much as we've done previously in the first topic with rate constants times partial pressures. That's going to come up at some point. They're all pretty much directly analogous. So let's move to uh, speed and momentum of molecules. So I'm going to cover just a few assumptions we make in this uh, kinetic theory of gases section. Uh, one is that a gas consists of molecules in ceaseless motion. That means they don't stop. They just wander around. They don't just suddenly stop out of their own accord and then start moving again. After all, why would they? Um, you might think, oh, they'll slow down because of air resistance, but kind of on a molecular scale, the molecules themselves are the air, and air resistance is a kinetic kind of collision. So without a collision, they don't stop. They just keep traveling on without stopping. Um, so you will we'll later cover on um, what's the average distance they can travel before they collide. It can be sometimes a lot longer than you might think. Uh, and we're also going to assume that molecules have negligible size. Their diameter is much less than the, the distance between them. Now, this isn't to say that they are point particles without any uh, any kind of extent whatsoever. So if you're used to a little bit of mechanics and physics, you'll be used to the concept of a point particle. That is a point, and it's a particle that doesn't have a dimension. It is literally infinitely small. No matter how big you zoom in, uh, it doesn't have any dimension. Uh, no, what we're saying is that its size compared to the distance between them is small. So we're looking at situations like this. Yes, you can see that they do have an actual size and an extent, but this distance between them is huge. But we're not going to focus on cases where say, there's size and they're a lot closer together. The, the distance between them there is almost on par with their size. So that would be something more like you would see in a liquid uh, this is more what you would see in a gas. The distances here are huge. Uh, and then molecules interact by elastic collisions. Uh, this basically means that the collisions are perfect and they transfer energy around perfectly. I, I'll not spend too much time on that definition of elastic. Please just go look it up if you're confused by it. It just means that energy is transferred efficiently uh, and instantaneously. So. We are stepping a little away from reality and we're treating them almost like hard, perfect snooker balls here that, that don't slow down or interact in any kind of squidgy way. Um, but do look that definition up in your own time if you want to know a bit more about it. It does have some very interesting specifics. Uh, so what can we get from the speed and momentum of molecules? We're going to define pressure. Uh, and so we're going to get pressure from the number of molecules. We're going to relate this microscopic property of just molecules moving around to pressure, which is something we can measure in our lab. Uh, so I'm going to start with just almost a thought experiment here. So we're going to find a box with three dimensions here. I don't know if you call it X, Y, and Z dimensions. And one of these walls is going to have an arbitrary sized area on it. And we're going to label that area A. And we're also going to sort of get a distance away from here. Um, and we're going to define this as the velocity in the extraction times by a particular time. Again, it will become clear why I'm not giving this a time. Um, that's the delta t. It's just an arbitrary period of time. It could be a millisecond. It could be a second. It doesn't matter. Um, but to explain that a little further, if our velocity is in meters per second, our time is in seconds, those cancel out. That is therefore a distance in meters. So what we've got here is a another sub box based on that's kind of defined as you know related to the speed of a molecule so any particular molecule heading in the extraction at a particular speed um, can hit the wall uh, here uh, now just to kind of further confusion I'm using uh, Vx here to mean velocity in this extraction uh, we could also have Vy, which means in this direction, or Vz, which means in whichever direction. Uh, however you want to define these coordinates. Oh, actually, I have... I should probably set these labels right. There we go. 
uh, x, y, and z directions. They're arbitrary, but it's sort of breaking out, uh, breaking down a velocity in a particular direction into smaller units. So if our molecule was heading in this direction, up in there, then well, that's vx, this is vy, and why we're breaking that up will become a bit clearer in a moment. We're only interested in its direction, its velocity in the x direction. Uh, what we're also interested in is momentum. And now, strictly speaking, that should also be px, because it's momentum only in one direction. And momentum comes from mass times velocity. So if you're not familiar with this concept, momentum is the value that is conserved when two things collide. So a large object that's moving slowly will hit a small object, and the small object will move off quicker because momentum is uh, conserved. Something with a smaller mass must leave with a higher velocity. Uh, and now if that oxygen molecule hits and bounces off the wall, let's just watch that again, boom, uh, it will change its momentum and it changes it by 2m times the magnitude of the velocity. Now that looks a little bit more scary, but let's break that down. It's because the momentum is going positive in one direction and then it comes back perfectly opposite in the other direction. Remember, these are perfect elastic collisions we're assuming no energy is lost. It just hits the wall, comes back with the exact same speed. So it comes from positive uh, of this value going in that direction, and then it comes back with the exact same. So it has changed by two in total, as far as the total magnitude change is concerned. Uh, and now how many potential collisions? It comes back to this whole Vx times T thing. Uh, we have N, which is the total number of molecules we have per volume area. And then we want to calculate the volume of um, the number of molecules that would be in the area that could actually make this collision here. So what? how many molecules can hit that? Well, we know their relative concentration. We just take that area and then we times it by this distance. So that is the number of molecules in this little sub box here. And why not 0.5? Uh, well, 50% of the molecules are going to be heading towards the wall. They're going to be heading in this kind of direction. Maybe they're not uh, heading straight to it, but maybe they're going to glance at it. Hence why we've broken the sum to the x. Uh, and the other half are going to be flying off in this other direction. They're not going to be going anywhere near the wall. So we half it. Statistically speaking, only half are going to be heading in the right direction to make that collision. So we have that. So when we multiply them together, can you hear that? That's uh, Glenn Lee's computer does that all the time. I don't know why. Uh, so we multiply those together and we want to get the change in total momentum that occurs. So we take how many molecules we get and we take the individual molecule and we multiply those together. So we can collapse down a few things if we rearrange these a little bit we notice the two uh let's go back we notice these two and two cancel out for instance and we get the total change of momentum is equal to the number of molecules as in a concentration of them multiply by an area by the mass by a velocity squared so that term is going to become useful soon and then by this delta t which is arbitrary so the next section i'm going to say why that delta t is arbitrary there it goes good bouncing again so our total pressure is equal to this, as we've just worked out. Now we want to work it out in terms of force. Now force is defined as a rate of change of momentum. Uh, now you might just think force is equal to mass times acceleration, but kind of break it down here. That's force is equal to mass times your velocity per time again. So you've got a mass and a velocity here, so that's the momentum delta t. So force is a rate of change of momentum as well as it is just acceleration. So we can cancel out that delta t, we don't need it. Uh, and it gets us here. Now we want to get it in terms of pressure. Now pressure is defined as force divided by an area. Uh, so we can cross out that a as well. So we've crossed out the delta t, we've crossed out the a, and we get pressure is equal to m n, the number of molecules in per area times the mass times this velocity x squared. So now we've actually, all of these arbitrary terms like the delta t and the a and so on start to cancel out. We don't need them, hence why I never defined them in the first place. So if we break this down, we now have pressure is equal to the number of molecules 
times their mass times their velocity squared. Uh, now just quick note on this notation. Uh, this is sort of a bra ket notation. Uh, and this means sort of average value slash expectation value. You see it a lot in quantum mechanics, but you also see a lot in statistics as well. It just, when you see this, as far as you're concerned right now, that just means average value. It appears in other things, but you're just interested in the terms average value. So their average value of their speed is equal to pressure. Because obviously some molecules are going to be quite sluggish, although they're not going to go a lot faster, uh, but they're going to average out. And when we measure all the molecules on the macroscopic level in the lab, uh, we're just going to get an average. We can't really get a difference between, we can't detect the difference between really fast molecules and slow molecules very easily. We're just measuring an average. So let's just review this for a minute. Why pressure? Um, the we, Pressure is defined as the force that comes from molecules that hit the sides of a container. Uh, not necessarily a container, by the way, that's just sort of an abstract thought experiment. It can still be a force outwards into another gas, for instance. It's the force that could cause work to happen, for instance, if you think back to your thermodynamics. And we can calculate it from certain molecular properties, namely their mass and their speed. So to run through that derivation very quickly again, we want to calculate force and pressure. So we find the momentum change of the colliding molecule. Remember that momentum changes double that, so it's that way, then that way. Then we want to find the number of molecules that can strike an area, so that's their velocity times a, just an arbitrary length of time, and we multiply them up by the number of molecules, the area, the mass, and so on, to get this whole macroscopic force that's happening. Then, because force is the rate of change of momentum, we can cancel out the delta T, because pressure is per area, we can cancel out the A, so we get this final equation here that relates pressure to the number of molecules and their mass and their velocity squared. So that velocity squared becomes a bit important later. So now speed and momentum of molecules, that's not the end of the story because as I said, we have Vx was uh, our interesting uh, property, but these molecules will be flying in any direction and they will be broken down to a particular V, Y, Z, and Vx. Again, not too convinced by that. I imagine it was flying off in this direction. We could break that down into two components, the Vy and the Vx. There we go. If it was entirely flying by coincidence or design in just one direction, then obviously its overall velocity in any direction is exactly the same as Vx, because it's constrained entirely into one direction. Uh, so do spend some time wrapping your head around this kind of vector thing. It's really useful in physics and physical chemistry to be able to break up um, directions into the three component parts of x, y, and z. Uh, we would think of a velocity in the x, y, z direction as uh, Vx plus Vy plus Vz, for instance. It just breaks up. Or uh, we might even notate it like Vx, V, oops, Vy, Vz. We might notate it as that. By the way, you just need to know that it breaks up into three x, y, z's. So let's bring back to our equation we had last time. Pressure is equal to the number of molecules times mass times that velocity squared, or it's proportional to a one-dimensional velocity squared. Uh, but we're interested in their average speed in all directions. So we're now going to label this C. Uh, I don't know why we're labeling the speed. The lecture notes I've picked up from last year are C. You might see it differently in different textbooks. All you need to know is that this is speed. It's independent of direction. Yeah, now, in that first math thing, when I talk about differentiation, I said velocity has a direction. It could be positive or negative. Speed doesn't. So this speed idea here um, is completely independent of direction. We're just interested in speed. But it can't be negative. It doesn't have direction associated with it. Uh, and we're going to square it. Uh, y squared? Uh, well, have a look at here. I've drawn a right angle triangle. So hopefully you're familiar with Pythagoras' theorem, that whole a squared plus b squared equals c squared thing. In three dimensions, well, it just turns out that a squared plus b squared plus c squared equals d squared. So you can satisfy yourself of that in your own time, I think. But for now, you just need to realize this is basically just Pythagoras' theorem. Uh, so we take our x, y, and z velocities, square them, we get 
the speed squared. So now we're starting to see where the whole squared part of this root mean squared term is coming from. The whole squared thing is because well, we have this vx squared, and then we can do Pythagoras to get a speed. Uh, now, these molecules are going to be moving randomly, remember, they're not going to be in something like a jet that's they're predominantly flying in one direction. So all of this random ceaseless motion means they go in any direction whatsoever. So an average speed in the x direction is going to be equal to the average speed in the y and the z directions, vice versa. So it doesn't really matter which one we collapse in, uh, we can replace this with vx squared plus v x squared plus vx squared, all three of those combined together, uh, so it becomes c squared is equal to three times, just a one-dimensional velocity. Uh, now we can just rearrange this, or at least bring in some of our previous pressure equations, uh, and realize that some threes and some dividing things come in. So let's have a look at this. We're now dividing it by three because we're substituting our vx for c here. And what we find, what we can now start bringing into the ideal gas equation. Now, uh, once again, this pen has decided to, there we go, now it's back. Uh, I can draw again. So PV equals NRT. This is one of those t equations that in physical chemistry should be practically tattooed onto your eyeballs. You should know this off by heart. Uh, you know you can replace uh, N for a number of molecules in the Avogadro's number, and you should be able to know you can replace R with the Boltzmann constant if you relate them. So we can actually replace PV equals NRT with this and rearrange slightly. So we end up substituting, um, we end up getting a formula for our pressure in terms of number of moles, Avogadro's number, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> um, Boltzmann constant, temperature, and volume. Now, here's our origin. Uh, so, here when we want to, uh, sorry, missed a bit out. We originally defined previously that n is the number of molecules per unit volume. So that means that whole n times Avogadro's number divided by volume equals the big n that we had previously. So we can substitute that into there. And have a look at this one. We realise we've now can get pressure in two complete in terms of two completely different equations here one in terms of number of molecules boltzmann constant and temperature and another in terms of total number of molecules their mass and their speed squared so this is the one that comes from uh, what we've just done involving speeds and the microscopic properties this comes from mostly the ideal gas law uh, and then we can equate them together do a little bit of rearranging and then finally rooting stuff together so we've got uh, we bring the three over to that side, uh, then we bring the mass over to that side, so we get things in terms of the speed squared. The speed squared is great, but we probably want to root it, so here is our final equation. After all of that, that's 20 minutes worth of derivations and explanation here. Uh, we have, finally, this one formula. So this is the formula you need to be aware of, this is the one that you will have to apply, uh, and this is basically saying that speed of a molecule is related to only two factors. One, its mass, two, the temperature. And this is one of the neat things about gases, the Boltzmann constant and the gas constant say that all gases effectively behave the same, it doesn't matter what they are, and it's one of the great things about kinetic theory of gases. Uh, granted those are in ideal conditions, such as relatively low pressures, where the all those, uh, those three um, assumptions are laid out earlier called true, uh, but that's really great. It means you can do an experiment for one gas, substitute it for a completely different gas, and you get similar results. So let's review the root mean squared again. So where does that three come from? Well, the last calculation we only did was in terms of Vx, a one dimension. So that whole thought experiment with the box, we were only interested in velocity in one direction. Uh, the random movement implies that all those velocities broken into three directions should be the same, so we can just substitute for um, three times it. Let's make that ends a typo, it shouldn't be there. Uh, the root part, so the last calculation showed pressure is related to the velocity squared, so when we want to get the speed we label it c and then we obviously bring a square root in to get it back. 
and the KB and T, well, we want to substitute in from the ideal gas law, so that N and R can be replaced by the Boltzmann constant and the number of molecules, that is our big N that we had originally. And then when we combine the two equations, we can start cancelling out all the things we don't need. We don't need to know the number of molecules. We don't need to know the size of the volume or the areas or anything. All we need to know is the Boltzmann constant, temperature, mass. And there we go. That is our equation that we need to be aware of. So finally, the, our last review of the entire section, the last 25 minutes. Pressure is analogous to concentration. So in kinetics, we want to be uh, all of these. Hang on, that's a hold over. That should be it. Um, velocity and pressure. Well, pressure is a force exerted on a container or on molecules that are surrounding something. And so we can find out the force of an individual molecule and then multiply it up to get the macroscopic value. And the mean squared speed, uh, the mean squared speed. Uh, C can be calculated from the number of molecules and just the temperature via this equation. So that is the one you need to know, uh, and we will try to apply it in the lecture. I will have you shove some values into it, do some other problem solving, and we'll introduce the other uh, related ones in later screencasts and lectures as well. So hope you did manage to follow that. Uh, Hope it was useful in helping derive where this equation comes from. You don't need to memorize this derivation, just be aware of the thought process behind it. Uh, certainly you need to know that this just doesn't come out of nowhere. We do genuinely have a reason for using it uh, and for why it looks like that. So until next time, goodbye.